أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وما كان رب وما كان ربك مهلك القرى حتى يبعث في أمها رسول يتلو عليهم آياتنا وما كنا مهلك القرى إلا وأهلها الظالم صدق الله العظيم Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Your Lord would never destroy a town until he had sent to its capital or center a messenger, reciting our revelations to them. Nor would we ever destroy a society unless its people persisted in wrongdoing. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Welcome to another edition of Islam for Europeans. Uh, a few housekeeping issues. Uh, we just started our Islam 101 series, uh, which is teaching the very basics of Islam. Uh, Brother Yusuf is uh, running it. Uh, Jazakallah khair for, uh, for running that. And we hope that, um, you know, that uh, not just the converts who watch this channel, but just anyone, any Muslim uh, who wants like a refresher course, and, like the basic, very basics of the deen. Um, you know, it's it's great to check out, and inshallah, we'll be releasing uh, more of those videos. Um, it's also great if you wanted to show your your non-Muslim family. We try to keep it as simple as possible, um, and you know, not saying just the Arabic, uh, so either the English or the Arabic, and then we say the English uh, translation. So, uh, inshallah, you know, that's you know one of the main. You know, you can't have an Islamic channel without having you know, like information on Islam. And I think that's really important. So hopefully, you know, the non-Muslims and the Muslims who are watching our channel uh, will check it out and, uh, and and watch it. And please give any suggestions or ask any questions. Uh, but yeah, that, that's pretty much about it. So while Yusuf handling the Islam 101 courses, I still wanted to, you know, talk about a lot of these, um, you know, socio-political issues that are affecting, you know, not just uh, Euro European converts, and not just converts in general, but the entire Muslim community. And one of these major issues that I wanted to talk about that I haven't really gotten the chance to um, is the urban-rural divide. Uh, so what do I mean by that? Uh, so, you know, you know, we've been talking about the relationship between Islam and the, and the Anglosphere um, and how to bridge those gaps. Um, but without really understanding the playing field uh, that you're dealing with, um, you know, your, 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 your methods are just going to go in all directions and you're not going to understand, uh, you know, what the people are about. You're not going to understand the situation that Muslims are living in and non-Muslims are living in and the attitudes and how to ameliorate the situation, uh, not just for the, you know, the, the Muslim community in the West, but, you know, ultimately for, you know, the, the people who are living there. Right. So, um, you know, just to give a background of what we're talking about. Um, so, as you know, like um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be using Ontario as a demographic example because I'm from Ontario and Canada. Um, although, you know, you can probably extrapolate uh, this data to you know, the United States, uh, you know, and other countries in, in Europe proper. Uh, so for the sake of clarity, what we'll do is we'll divide these kind of geographic areas um, into four basic types. You know, um, you have super Anglo areas or SA areas. So this is basically any rural area or any village or small town that, you know, you could say is 95% white European, right? You have high Anglo or HA areas. So small towns to mid-level cities that are at least 85% white. You have medium Anglo or MA, where whites are a majority, still a majority, but between 50 to, to 80 percent, you know, like the city of London that I'm living in right now. Uh, and then finally, you know, multicultural or MC. Um, so these are basically large, ginormous metropolitan areas. Um, and you know, usually in these areas, white people tend to be the minority. So it's less than 50 percent. And, you know, I spent, you know, several years in Toronto. I spent several years in, in Mississauga. Um, and I know that in Toronto proper, um, you know, there are more than at least a dozen mosques. Um, and the suburbs of Toronto, like Etobicoke, I checked, they have a dozen mosques. There are 15 mosques, you know, uh, just from Google Maps in Scarborough. Uh, there are seven masjids in New York, uh, North York, sorry. Uh, 16 masjids in Mississauga. 
which is, you know, for people who don't know, it's a city right next to Toronto. Um, you have 12 masjids in Brampton. And in addition, basically all major Islamic organizations are headed in the greater Toronto area, or what we call the GTA, right? The more you branch out into, you know, into medium Anglo cities like London, Ontario, or high Anglo cities like, um, like Chatham, there are still mosques there. I mean, they've just started to have a burgeoning, you know, Muslim community. For example, there are a dozen mosques here in the in the city of London. But um, at the same time, they don't really have the same level of resources that a lot of these mosques in the uh, greater Toronto area have. So for the most part, these mosques, their whole frame of reference and how they deal with the greater community is going to be centered around, you know, the goings on and the the culture of these large cities, right? So large metropolitan multicultural areas, right? And even, you know, the Muslims who came to the West for the most part, most of them also come from major cities as well, like Karachi, Lahore, Damascus, Abu Dhabi, Dubai. So you have a lot of Muslims living in the West, right? But who for the most part, you know, like, let's just say that, you know, I guess masjid goers or mosque goers, they don't really hang out with non-Muslims to begin with. And they really don't, for the most part, interact with or have deep, relate, meaningful relationships with white people to begin with. If they do, normally it's going to be, you know, obviously rather white, people, white people who live in those cities. And the whites who live in those cities, they tend to be more liberal, you know, to begin with. So, um, you know, so you have that going on. And in addition, you know, in the large cities, and I lived in, when I lived in Toronto in 2011, uh, you know, a lot of the, all of the basically, you know, kind of right-wing Islamophobic organizations um, are headquartered in the GTA as well, right? So they weren't in, you know, smaller, high Anglo cities like Windsor, you know, Rebel Media and The Sun, uh, they were all headquartered also in the GTA. So you have kind of like, this is where, in these large metropolitan cities that they really butt heads, right? So, and, you know, in particular, you have people who are coming from all over the world, right? And those people who come from all over the world to these large, you know, multicultural cities, they're going to have, let's just say, varying opinions on Islam. And it's not always going to be good. It's not always going to be pretty. And a lot of these people, uh, you know, they're not always white either, right? So you have, for example, Arab Christians, and, you know, not, not to harp on Arab Christians, but, um, you know, I worked for actually for an Arab Christian and then months into working for them, this was in, in the GTA, they found out that I was Muslim and then they did not like Islam whatsoever, right? So, you know, uh, I eventually was fired from that position, but I moved on. Um, you also have Hindu groups, right? Uh, in fact, when I was living in Mississauga in 2011, I remember very distinctly that there was a protest against a Jumu'a Friday prayer in a high school back in 2011 um, at, a high, at a high school in Toronto. And I remember distinctly, it was headed by a Hindu group, right? You also have ex-Muslims, you know, coming, you know, to the West and hanging out in these large metropolitan areas. So, you know, a lot of these, I remember there was an attack on a mosque a couple of months ago in Mississauga, and it was actually an ex-Muslim that, uh, that did it. And even when I was going to university, there was an ex-Muslim who uh, went into the prayer room and sort of ripping up pages of the Quran and stuff. Um, you know, and then on top of that, you also have, I guess, European immigrants. So, you know, white European, uh, white Europeans who immigrate to, you know, the GTA and, you know, they have varying opinions on Islam, as you know, and, you know, they tend to be, I guess, more Islamophobic than your average, you know, white Canadian, right? So when I lived in the GTA back in, you know, 20, 2009 to 2011, um, the Islamophobia industry, what I mean by that is <laughs> not the way the left means. I mean, the I guess the way that the left is, you know, sort of uh, now uh, gotten a hold of it. Before then, they didn't really get control of it. You know, like, you know, it wasn't, it didn't become a racial issue. You know, like, I guess even mosques before back then, even though, you know, they kind of had varying attitudes on, on white people, um, you know, for the most part, they realized that, you know, a lot of, White people don't have a problem with this uh, Islam. There are several white converts. It's a lot easier as a white person to convert to Islam 
uh, back in the 2000s, mid to late 2000s, as opposed to now. Um, and, you know, like uh, they just, you know, met people eye to eye, you know, they had, you know, they talked to politicians and things like that. And, you know, there's less of a, um, I guess, this aura of like this, you know, conflation between Islamophobia and race. Um, but that's all changed now. I mean, since, you know, the woke left has basically captured, you know, the Islamophobia industry, um, they, they make it their business to make it seem like the vast majority of white people uh, hate Muslims, right? Uh, and the vast majority of those white people are, you know, once you exit the GTA, once you exit the greater Toronto area, you know, if you're a Muslim, you know, traveling in a small town, any small white town they visit, they want to pump it into your head that all the white people hate you. They all hate Islam. They all hate Muslims. They're all going to rip your hijab off. They're going to chase you out of town with a pitchfork. And of course, on top of that, since you have no visible minority collective group of Western white Muslims, you know, like you do with the African American Muslim community in the States, the Latino Muslim community, and I've elucidated a lot of those reasons why that is. Uh, even in the GTA, I mean, aside from, you know, you have Bosnia mosque and stuff, but for the most part, um, a lot of Muslims don't understand that the attitudes towards Islam and Muslims in the Anglo sphere even though it exists, it's not nearly as bad as it seems, right? Uh, I mean, I, I mean, when I converted to Islam, you know, I'm from a small town, about 20,000 people, Amherstburg, Ontario, represent, you know, my whole family knew that I was Muslim. Uh, among my family, most of them had no problem with it. My friends, for the most part, had no problem with it, right? Um, as far as I know, there has never been one anti-Islamic incident in my hometown. Even the European-run cafe in my hometown, they said they had no problem with a Muslim praying there, right? So, um, but I mean, it's very difficult and I can't, ex um, I can't expect a lot of born Muslims to just say, quote unquote, get over it if you're going to one of these small towns. And I understand the fear is always going to be there. You know, they don't look white and, you know, they're going to get stares because they're di they, they look different. You know, you're the only blue ball in a, you know, a big container of red balls. Just like when I go to the masjid, I'm usually the only white male convert there. So, you know, you're, you're going to stick out, right? Uh, but again, like I said, you have the woke left in like these large cities, like, you know, the GTA, you know, they, you know, run the ship uh, at every university, every, you know, like uh, uh, left-wing run company. And usually when they give a lot of these, <laughs> these kind of, lessons you know to like companies about like islamophobia they don't teach anything about islam right they just you know it's all about islamophobia and you know like uh, conflating it with all types of other phobias transphobia and whatnot and you know they don't want to give dollar to the west let's just be honest i mean it would be against their i mean why would they want westerners to have stronger families and more protection from vice uh, and so on and so forth right you know, so, and again, on the, on the other side of the story, a lot of rural, rural uh, whites, you know, the whites living in, you know, uh, super Anglo or high Anglo areas, they're not going to interact with Muslims very often either, right? So the only information they're going to get about Islam and Muslims is from the media and the internet, um, or, you know, from, you know, talking at the coffee shop, you know, talking about stuff that you're not allowed to talk to at work, uh, you know, like, and I'm sure a lot of these issues that, you know, they see in right-wing media that some Muslims are doing, which may or may, not, may or may not be true, or may or may not be associated with Islam in the first place. You know, those ideas are gonna create this kind of echo chamber, right? Um, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, so what does this mean, I guess, for the white person from a rural or small town area when we convert to Islam? And how is that compared to, you know, whites who live in like large metropolitan areas, right? Well, several things. I mean, when you're in a small town or the countryside and there are no Muslims, right? Even if the, the you know, the, the people you grew up with, your friends and family, even if they have no problem with you converting to Islam, it's still not a Muslim society. Like there's no presence of Islam there. Like people are drinking alcohol, there's a lot of gambling, women walking around with bikinis, um, you know, smoking, uh, drug use, uh, bush parties. 
it's not an Islamic environment. You know, it's very difficult to create these niches when you're the only Muslim in that small town. And for me, I traveled to go to the mosque. It took me 30 minutes to drive to Windsor to go there, right? And I would go there. Sometimes I would go there just to pray, stay there, and then make, you know, pray. I would go there and pray Maghreb, stay there until Isha, pray Isha, and then go back home. Sort of just to, get, to give myself an Iman boost, right? Um, but even that is just an enormous challenge because, like, you're, you're literally living in two worlds. And a lot of the Muslim community, they simply don't want to go to these small towns to meet your family. Right. And I don't blame them. You know, I really don't blame. Them, right. So that in and of itself is an enormous challenge for the small rural convert to Islam. Right. So and then, and then, you know, a lot of these converts, they have no choice, really, if they, you know, the, their dean matters to them, that they feel like they need to move to a big city. Maybe it's for another reason. You know, maybe it's conflated combined with another reason, like, hey, there's Muslims living in this big city and there's more job opportunities. So I'll move there. Right. You know, which is a challenge and it happens to everybody. But I mean, not everyone has the means to do that. And it's a challenge in and of itself, right? I mean, you know, um, but at the same time, since you're living in that small town, you cannot give up on the relationship with those people. They mean a lot to you. And you can't just ditch them and move to a big city. I mean, as a Muslim, you cannot cut family ties, right? And it's super important for you uh, to mitigate and improve the relationship with your family, because that means also big things for the greater Muslim community, because you yourself, as a convert, you have a lot of influence on these people. So, so bringing all of these factors together, you know, what do we have? We have large multicultural, huge areas like Toronto uh, and Vancouver and Montreal, where, all, you know, where you have a big Muslim population, you have a big multicultural population, um, and it's a different world once you step out of those cities. Uh, it's almost like a line of demarcation that you could see in every election, right? I mean, most, you know, uh, the pro uh, counties that are mostly white in Canada are painted blue on election day. And in the States, they're painted red, Republican red. Um, but that doesn't mean that they all hate Muslims. I mean, you have to keep that in mind, right? So what do we at Islam for Europeans recommend to the Mus Muslim communities living in the West? Well, if you really want to combat Islamophobia, first of all, don't listen to the people running the organizations that want to fight or end Islamophobia. They're just making it worse, right? If you really want to give dawah to the, you know, the, the white majority in the West, the best idea is to financially support the converts from those small towns to give them the resources to build a mosque in their hometown, even if it's just a shack, even if it's just a musalla, like it's a Conestoga hut and you build it for like $3,000 and you only four or five people can pray in it. And you have the converts from those towns run that place, right? And it would be an Islamic European center. So they would cook European food for iftar, lasagna, lushki, spaghetti, you know, um, Western food basically. The dress would be the traditional dress or trad clothing from that era from you know centuries past. Like in Amherstburg, it's a military town. I mean, they don't want to dress like the military, but you can dress the traditional dress. They, even if it's just for Eid, right? Um, you know, the architecture. How many abandoned churches are there in these small towns like Kincardin and Amherstburg and you know Harrow, right? That are just sitting there and are just gonna end up being demolished. Uh, anyway, and turned into a parking lot. You know, it, uh, you can get a dirt cheap, right? Um, you know, so the architecture would be European. Sports and games would be, you know, the sports and games that the people from that area are used to and that they're familiar with, right? Um, and if born Muslims are driving through that town, you know, they are more welcome to pray there. We will give them all their Islamic rights, just like when we're in their mosque, they give us all of our Islamic rights, right? The only difference is the culture would be European, even though we would be following the, the Sunnah. We'd be getting, getting rid of the bad things in our culture and just keeping the good things, right? If you do it that way, you know, where you have a group of collective like 30, 50, you know, 70 uh, Muslims from that town. Uh, the whole town would much more easily realize that Islam does care about cultural preservation. 
they we do care that Islam as a way of life can reform their communities for the better. You know, they they will see the beauty of the Islamic uh, faith, uh, and they will see that you know that uh, this is a religion from our Creator uh, that He wants us to follow, and that we are you know keeping those that traditionalism alive, right? And then even the, for the people who really dislike Islam, uh, inshallah, their hearts. You know, you may be able to get them down from a minus 100 to a minus 70. For those who are interested in maybe in Islam, you might, you know, get a bunch of them to convert. And because you have other converts around them that are from that, you know, from that same small town, you know, um, you can actually build a niche. Right. And that way you, you alleviate the barriers to entry for the rural convert to, to, to Islam. And that's how you start to change the game in the atmosphere. In the large cities, you can still have an Islam for European center, but you still have to have a collective of maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 white converts. Uh, and then you, you build it up. Right? So, and the same goes, you know, uh, for First Nations. I mean, there are First Nations reserves all over Ontario. Uh, you know, you have Moravian Town, uh, you know, like you have Bothwell. Uh, I mean, you know, uh, our First Nations people here, they need Islam just as much as we do. In fact, maybe even more. And, you know, um, we should apply the exact same model, right? First Nations converts should be given the resources and the money to build a musalla at a, at a First Nations reserve. And it would be uh, Islamic. They would be following the Sunnah. But they should be able to keep and not just keep, but go back to their traditional culture. And that's how you change the hearts and minds, inshallah, of the people from that region. It's been done for centuries. What I'm talking about is nothing new. Muslims have been doing this for centuries, right? It's just that for the most part, they're living in monocultural society. So it doesn't really matter because you, you brought people from that region to give da'wah and then they, their people converted on mass. All right, so that's my time for the day. Uh, this is Robert from Islam for Europeans. Please subscribe to the channel uh, and uh, please watch the Islam 101 uh, videos and give us your feedback. Okay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.